and welcome. I'm very pleased to have so many of you with us here today for uh, another This is CDR. This is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air Collective. Um, and uh, the purpose for our being here is to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals we have under development for New York and a number of other states and localities. Some quick background on Open Air. Um, Open Air is a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, we have a large and growing global community, and we work together on shared open source missions relating to policy advocacy, which is what we're talking about here today, um, research and development, and also market development for carbon uh, dioxide removal pathways. There's some links in the chat uh, to follow us on Twitter and to sign up for our uh, Discord server. And so uh, please, if you're interested, join us. We'd love to have you. Um, and I uh, forgot to introduce myself. Toby, Toby Bryce, based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on CDR policy advocacy with Open Air. And everyone, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we love to kind of make the chat interactive and have people carry on a conversation about what we're talking about there as well. Before we get started, just some, many of you know, but some quick background on carbon dioxide removal. Um, you know, it's important to define CDR as, you know, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and durably storing it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoars or in long-lived products. And two things about this definition. Number one, it's really important to disambiguate uh, CDR from what's typically called carbon capture, which is capturing CO2 from point source emissions, like a natural gas plant or a, a cement plant or a steel plant. Carbon dioxide, and that's, a, that's important, and it's a way to reduce emissions, but it does not remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's really important to think about this carbon dioxide removal as activities that directly remove um, through human intervention CO2 from the atmosphere. The other important thing to talk, think, uh, call out upfront when we're talking about CDR is that it is in no way a substitute for not reducing emissions, for reducing emissions. It's not an excuse to not reduce emissions. We have to reduce emissions as quickly and as completely as possible and decarbonize our economy as fully as possible, as soon as possible, full stop. That said, every credible climate forecast, including most recently the IPCC, the most recent IPCC annual report, um, indicate that gigaton scale carbon removal is going to be needed by mid-century in order to limit warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. A gigaton is a billion tons, and that's a lot of mass. Um, we are currently, you know, we have a lot of interesting um, CDR pathways, which we're exploring here with the series, but in aggregate across the world, we remove less than 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, via CDR in uh, 2021. So we have many orders of magnitude we need to scale. Um, we're not going to get to gigaton scale if we don't start working on it now. And so, you know, we need to like get started now this decade and, you know, get to megaton scale and then go from there to get to gigaton scale. A lot of resources about CDR, we'll be putting those in the chat. Right here, we have an icon for the carbon dioxide removal primer, which is kind of the textbook or Bible of CDR and a great place to start. Um, there's some great documents from DOE who have a very important C, uh, CDR earthshot trying to get CDR pathways down to $100 a ton by 2030. Um, and we'll put some other uh, some other important resources in this in chat. Um, now I want to hand it over to my colleague Mega, who will give you a little bit more information about the run of show and also introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Abby. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Mega. I am an open air member based in London, but working on policy advocacy opportunities out in California, where I'm from. Um, just as our usual housekeeping note, so our format will be 15 to 20 minutes of presentation, followed by a few prepared questions, and then we'll have moderated audience Q&A. So please type any questions that you have into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, note that that's separate from the chat, so make sure you find the one that's labeled Q&A. The event is being recorded and we'll send the video link out to anyone who registered. We'll also post it to our Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel, um, which uh, the links should be in the chat any minute now. So uh, you can find those there after the show. Um, now for the main event. So this week, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Ning Zheng of the University of Maryland to tell us about the opportunity to durably sequester carbon at a low cost and significant scale while wood harvesting and storage, or WHS, which is the secure burial of waste wood biomass. Dr. Zhang is the founder of the Carbon Lockdown Project and a world-leading world expert on this emergent CDR pathway. Dr. Ning Zhang is a professor at the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science and the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center at the University of Maryland and affiliate professor with the Department of Geology and the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute. He earned a BS in Physics from the University of Science and Technology in China, an MS degree in Astrophysics and a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Arizona. 
He has worked at MIT, UCLA, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, the Institute of Atmospheric Physics, and the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. Um, his professional interests include climate change and variability, carbon cycle and ecosystem, carbon sequestration, and other technical solutions and policy implications of climate change. Uh, Dr. Zeng, over to you. All right, I may go. Great. Um, so first, I want to thank OpenAir and Toby and Mega for giving me this opportunity to present at this forum. And uh, over the weekend, I look at a number of the past programs and um, a lot of clever ideas, great work uh, presented in this forum. I'm honored to be uh, part of this whole series. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this wood harvesting and storage idea. Um, let me start by a short introduction. What is WHS? Collect sustainably sourced woody biomass, such as natural waste wood, burying specially engineered structure called wood vault for secure carbon dioxide removal. The durability is shown by demo projects, 97% remains after 100 years, and it's low cost, $10 to $50 per ton CO2, depending on how it's done, and with low capital investment. Carbon efficient, the CO2 emissions during the operation is less than 2% of carbon sequestered. And it's a highly distributed, highly scalable technology. And we believe it's ready to deploy at megaton scale now and gigaton scale in 2030s. So let me go through my reasoning for all those claims uh, with this presentation. First, a quick comparison with other negative emissions technologies. Um, this earlier um, review paper by McLaren uh, put biomass burial at this corner, that is pretty low cost, but a technology level too. And the potential as shown by two our, our early papers and other work is two to 10 gigaton CO2 per year. However, since the publication of this paper with ongoing and past projects. And uh, we now believe the technology is commercially ready. Um, a couple of years ago, the National Academy of Sciences produced this influential uh, review book on negative emissions technology and reliable sequestration. And it was stated in the report that WHS could be viable approaches to increasing carbon removal. To date, this proposed approach has not been tested, though the technology is simple and easily applied. So it's simple conceptually. We have done it, so we know there are practical challenges. short history of WHS. So the early initial phase of scientific development summarizing these two papers, and then the Gemstone Carbon Science team from 2007 to 2010 demonstrated the feasibility of WHS and developed the methodology of doing it. This uh, was conducted on the Eastern shore of uh, Maryland. And then, the Montreal project started from 2013 and it's still ongoing. And uh, as a prototype wood vault, what we think is that will make this thing work in real world, 35 ton of wood was buried in anaerobic condition and it collected valuable real world operational data in particular on the cost and durability. So I'll have several slides uh, showing the results. Now, currently, the carbon lockdown project that is ongoing and several other emerging organizations and corporations, some of the audience might 
uh, be at the Air Miners event in October, where several uh, of these uh, companies, organizations were present. So now the concept of wood vault, uh, woody biomass, raw or minimally processed is buried logically topsoil above. So this is very different from usual like a soil carbon sequestration, which is really here. But we are talking about something that is way below. There's no uh, biologically active um, process going down at this level. And the, the key is it's kept at anaerobic condition, which prevents decomposition leading to durable storage. So the process in fact, akin to coal formation. So it would be surprised if this turns out to be a very natural way of undo fossil fuel emissions. Now in practice, the wood vault probably will, well, not probably, and uh, we're already working on it, would look like this. And this particular version is called mound. It's half underground, half above ground. And it's a centralized facility that collects such as natural waste wood from the surrounding region to minimize transportation cost and operational uh, CO2 emissions. And the wood is buried in an enclosure that may be subdivided into cells. And it was coupled, it was, it's capped with clay or other highly impermeable material to maintain anaerobic condition. Finally, at the end of the operation, the top soil is backfilled, which would allow grass to grow back. Then you can have um, agriculture, solar farm, agrovoltaics combination, or as recreation or other means. So finally, of course, you want to monitor it and uh, keep maintaining it just in case anything happens. So you can use sure durable sequestration. So what's showing here is actually what we call one wood vault unit or WVU. Oops. So it occupies one hectare or 100 meter by 100 meter area. That's the size of uh, two soccer fields, 20 meter tall. It has a effective wood volume of 100,000 cubic meter with 0.1 megaton CO2 sequestered. The wood source uh, can come from one year of currently unexploited urban waste wood from an area of 2,500 kilometer square. There are other versions of uh, this wood vault concept depending on the local condition and the different other cost economic considerations. And you can do fully above ground uh, mound or you can do fully below ground pit or quarry or mine. You can also do stack them on top of each other, what we call it super vault. There are other ways of doing it as well. So now a few slides to tell you about the Montreal project. So the project was designed in 2012 and mostly uh, carried out in 2013. And it is located um, at Saint P, uh, Quebec, Canada and basically the southeast uh, uh, suburb of Montreal. With this lot long showing here, you should be able to find the exact location on the Google map. And so this rectangular area is where the wood was actually buried. It's 20 meter by eight meter and four to five meter deep. And it's just outside the riparian buffer zone, 10 meter from the creek. So on the right, the main trench is where the 35 ton of wood was laid down, while there is a small side trench where we put down uh, several discs at different depths uh, in order to understand how decomposition might, uh, depend and, might be dependent on burial depths. 
So the wood was actually uh, collected during the previous season. So the creek had a, a lot of these dead trees and they are not caused by a beaver. And uh, so they are actually unwanted. The normal way is to collect them and burn. So consider that the baseline. So that was loaded and weighed and transported to a central location we call it a wood stockpile, stay through the winter. And then in March in 2013, and that's where the actual um, wood vault construction and burial was carried out. And here you see the trench after it was dug. You can see the people on the here and these discs on the side trench, while here is the main trench. So it's a pretty, um, Awesome, kind of a little bit. I was a little old seeing the whole operation, um, but it's pretty big trench, even though we're talking about only 35 town. But it's totally doable. And um, wood was laid down here and then backfilling the topsoil. The whole operation took four hours. So last November, uh, two days before Thanksgiving, we, uh, US Thanksgiving, um, so we um, went back to excavate some samples from the site. Now the grass has grown on, on, on the top. And so the first um, disc that was buried at half meter below the surface was taken out and then was examined by different people. Here uh, I put together uh, the photos of from 2013 before burial, one of the sample discs and one log that was excavated and cut in half. And then one log that was left at the surface in 2013, we left a small pile at the surface. Then we were able to recover them. So this is one of them back in the lab. So you can see the severely decayed uh, status for the 2013 surface log, while this one that was just dug out, cut in half, it looks like fresh. And then here's how they look like under a microscope. So the fresh wood we collected on site uh, during the excavation, and as well as the buried and excavated wood, they were both intact while the surface rotten one under the microscope looks also severely degraded. Now here's a key data, uh, mechanical strength. So here, I'm just gonna focus on the two surface rotten one here and the fresh wood and versus the disc recovered at a 1.5 meter, which is actually exactly this disc. So you see the mechanical strengths plotted on the y axis, sorry, x axis are basically the same. It's actually 0.3% difference. If you throw that change into a formula, that gives you 90 for, sorry, 97% um, remaining after 100 years. So here's another kind of analysis. FTIR, look at the chemical bonds of polysaturides. So again, the different levels, the surface one basically lost the signature of these OHCH bonds, but all the buried discs, even the half meter one still um, has all that feature of these chemical bonds intact. So we're it's still ongoing, we're still analyzing the results, but we have some thoughts on the durability. Huh. Extra extrapolating from eight and a half years of data to a hundred years is not really very comforting. How do you know it's exponential decay? But we can't wait for a hundred years to know the answer. The good news is that we have what we call scientific method. We can use experiment, process understanding and theory to do prediction. This is akin to how we do climate prediction. And more than that, we also have unintended experiments that is akin to use paleoclimate evidence, so to say something about future change. 
So here's such a natural experiment on durability. During the excavation in 2013, the excavator basically at one point dug out a log from this hole and was thrown on the ground. We rushed over to take a look. I picked the bark that was half detached and the ecologists from McGill University immediately identified it as red cedar. It was later dated as 3,775 years. So finally, let me summarize the Montreal project a result. 35 ton of CO2 was sequestered at a $20 per ton of CO2. The carbon footprint or efficiency, if you like, 2% of sequestered carbon. Durability is 100 to 1,000 years based on the data we have analyzed so far. And here's a flow diagram shows the whole process. The numbers are actually for this project. See the bottom, the key here is the natural process is outside the engineering boundary. That is the part, of course, we basically get it for free, quote. So it's this combination of nature and engineered methods really uh, uh, made this method work. So now let me move on to talk about the Carbon Lockdown Project. It's a public benefit corporation, a universe spin-off, and uses vertically integrated business model. We do project development, operation, monitoring, verification, direct sale to buyer. An important mission of this project is to support other operators. We will provide consulting for project development service on MRV certification and eventually acting as a marketplace. We specialize in WHS and related technologies with uh, patents on different aspects of it. Our next step is to conduct a 10 kiloton project. We will use about one acre of land in the mid-Atlantic region. We're pursuing three siting options in parallel, always in situ clay as shown here. Turns out this in deep clay called Altisol is widespread in southeastern US and northwestern US, coinciding with a forested area of the country. There is actually a fundamental scientific reason why they coincide. And one of the locations under consideration is University of Maryland Agriculture Research Facility. And the wood sourcing will mostly from uh, what's called urban waste wood. For example, here in the nearby city of Tacoma Park, this photo I took the other day when I jogged over there. And um, we will uh, demonstrate our MRV method with this real scale project, answer some very important scientific questions we have in mind. And we're in the process of clarifying logistics and budgets and initiating discussions with potential funders. Midterm opportunities, uh, I list a few of them. Uh, they all have co-benefits and we are envisioning 100 kiloton to multi megaton scale per project or closely uh, related cluster projects. They can be done on the time scale of a few years. So the urban project is basically a larger scale version of our near term project, as you can see here. Uh, the wood sourcing is already there. And then another one we called project mediation. There are a lot of these, um, you know, eye source of old mines. So bring in sequestration. As part of the story, we'll really hope uh, this process. And then finally, we all know the fire threatened uh, America West and other places, uh, thinning this and use it uh, in adding carbon sequestration benefit can make the economics really uh, work out, I believe. Then there are other opportunities like uh, storm blowdown, which happens in Florida all the time and other Southern states. 
and residue and so on. Finally, uh, wood barrier is a first step of fossilization process. So it's a natural way to undo fossil fuel burning and the durability with our admittedly still limited demo projects uh, showing that 97% remain after 100 years if it's done right. We know other examples that are not done right. And it's distributed a highly scalable 10 to $50 per ton CO2 and low capex and easy to monitor and very easy to monitor and verify. And the land occupied by wood vault is small and usable for other purposes. The environmental impact of wood vault can be kept at minimum. There are co-benefits with other activities such as waste wood management. Basically, we make a waste valuable and fire risk reduction, mine remediation, parks, solar development, extending carbon sink of reforestation. This point I did not uh, touch upon before, but I think could be an avenue that can lead to uh, gigaton scale. Sustainable wood sourcing is critical. I would say this is the most fundamental uh, limitation here. Uh, provides green jobs and uh, economically viable for large scale implementation in a serious worldwide carbon market. We expect megaton scale in 2025 and gigaton scale in 2030s. Um, thank you. Excellent, Dr. Zeng. Thank you so much. That was really, uh, I think a lot of people don't hadn't really thought about this. And I, it's a very, um, on the one hand, low tech, but it's also a very novel uh, idea. Um, so I guess the first question, um, I, you had a lengthy and impressive career uh, focused on maybe the larger carbon cycle. Can you just talk briefly about when you first started thinking about wood burial, or it was suggested in the comments, we call it wood sequestration or even reverse coal, which I think is very cool and uh, snappy. Um, when did you start thinking about it? And specifically, when did you start thinking about it as a way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere? Uh, it could be a long story, um, but it started in 2006. In 2006, I started to teach at University of Maryland a class called Carbon Cycle and Climate, which I'm teaching right now. I was teaching it one hour ago. <laughs> um, so in the class, me and students were discussing the so-called missing carbon sink. Uh, one of the things we were pondering was how much landfill uh, can actually sequester carbon for you know, longer than let's say decades. Then after that, in the summer, I was invited to Australia for a, a carbon cycle meeting. During the tea break, I talked to Dan Nepstad, who is an Amazon ecologist, and Anit Kawe, who is a landfill expert. So during the conversation, suddenly I said, how about we bury the deforested wood in a just bury it to sequester carbon. We laughed at it. And then on my way back from Sydney to LA, I could not sleep, totally jet lagged and seasonally lagged. And that idea came back to me. I just took out a paper and did basically the order of magnitude estimates. And uh, this 2000 paper, the key numbers were already on that napkin basically. <laughs> That's basically how it started. But later, of course, as you can see, I showed here, it's really the work of uh, many people. Um, this 2013 paper had actually DOE support at the Hans Center and a lot of interesting discussion. And um, anyway, so that's basically how it started. That's great. Um, obviously, a primary question about the pathway is the durability. Um, and you talked about that. Um, I think some things bear repeating. Can you just sort of recap the case for durability if you're asked by, you know, a potential funder, whether it's a Stripe or a Grantham Foundation or what have you, you know, how obviously we have limited data, but how can we think about the durability based on what we know so far and based on the scientific theory? Like what's the argument for hundred year durability and what's kind of the, the, the horizon for potential thousand year durability, which I know that you think is possible if it's done correctly. Yeah, 
I mean, that's a very hard question. Um, let me try this way. On one hand, for example, the Montreal Project, uh, that ancient log, 3,000 years old, we have many other such natural experiments. I have a 45 minute presentation on my website from a seminar I gave at any foundation where I listed a number of other um, archeological or geological accidental experiments, evidence. There are many of them. I frequently have people come to tell me how about Bogman, how about this Neanderthal, you know, 100,000 year old wooden spears and so on. So the key is, well, the main thing is based on all this evidence, even you disregard our Montreal project, which is, you know, no more than 10 years. We know that this can happen. This can be done. But we, what we do not know is exactly under what condition the ancient wood has been preserved. What are the keys that made such long-term preservation viable? So I think that's a research question I would like to address. In fact, I would like to collect a team of very interdisciplinary scientists from archaeology, geology, biology, you name it, together. And I have been trying, we have been trying to do this actually uh, with some partial success, but I fully envision a workshop or conference. We got all these experts from different, different fields sitting together, look at the evidence, and then we'll do some more experiments. Really, we can't wait for 100 or 1,000 years to see the result, the true outcome. But what we can do is really what we call scientific method. So we can actually do this. So this is one side. So on our side, I have seen things that don't work. There are a lot of such evidences, including the pile of mulch in my backyard. I know that's simply piled it up, buried there. It's not going to work. It's going to go away in five years, 10 years, 20 years. And it's just not enough. There are many people who have talked to me about Hugo culture. I'm, I'm afraid that's not gonna work for climate purpose. So, but what's in between? I think we can already make a lot of progress if we can get let's say the experts together, bring in the science, our understanding of this biological, whatever geological processes. So really it's something that I really, really like to be done. That's great. Um, so there are a lot of questions that we're going to get to in a minute in the in the Q and A, and a lot of them relate to potentially. So, so number one is just to be clear, we're talking about waste wood biomass. We're not talking about any sort of dedicated biomass or biomass that would go to any other purpose besides getting burnt or just sitting in a landfill and rotting and releasing CO two and potentially methane. Um, so it's waste wood biomass, but obviously, and we've explored in this program, there are a lot of different ways to valorize waste wood biomass for carbon dioxide removal. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a company called Moat that's going to gasify waste wood biomass, very similar to what you would use for your process and uh, generate hydrogen and sequester the CO2. You know, there's biochar, there's charm, which makes a bio oil, which they sequester. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons, not the pros and cons of the different pathways, but where, where WHS might be most apt, like relating to potentially the, the technology required and CapEx and everything else. You know, when you have waste wood biomass, when might this be the most appropriate way to use it for carbon removal? I would say in short term, I mean, your, the first part of your question seems to be pointing at competition for wood uh, sources. Um, eventually, I suppose where there will be if all these methods work out, you know, the productivity of the biosphere is the ultimate limitation. Um, so in long term, I think many factors will come in. We will choose the most um, the best method that balance all the factors, you know, the optimized method or methods, you know, which is, you know. We'll see how things evolve. In near term, I actually see very little competition. And uh, for example, uh, the advantage of WHS is it can be done mostly in situ. 
which minimizes transportation cost. And it has the has advantage that most of woody material can be buried, but not the easily decomposable. Like personally, I feel just for permanence, whole wood should preserve better than let's say sawdust. So I would say think sawdust, if you can utilize it, pyrolyze it and so on, it's probably better used for other waste wood utilizing techniques. While something like a wood pallets or the fire prevention thinning that cannot be really utilized by other methods right now. We can just bury it more or less in situ. And the, the advantage of WH is it's a low operation cost. So a lot of the wood that is currently really not utilized, like Florida, I was in Florida in January. They said after each hurricane, so many trees got taken down. They don't know how to use it. They just pile them up, burn it in the neighborhood. So we could have a um, facility in that neighborhood, let's say each county was one, can collect that, bury it. So again, every single idea deserves a billion dollars to explore their potential. But I think WHS has some advantage in terms of, you know, the immediate applicability. Yeah. And I think the, the, the synergy with, you know, what you've talked about with municipal waste wood and, and maybe co-locating with municipal, large, like large municipality landfills is super, landfills is super interesting. Um, one more question, then we want to get to the audience questions and thank you for those and please keep them coming. Um, another sort of potential limiting factor is land use. Um, I think one thing that's really exciting about the pathway is the amount of carbon you can sequester per, per unit of land. Um, you know, 100,000, uh, 0.1, 0.1 megaton, 100,000 kilotons of carbon in a hectare, which is 2.2 acres. Um, and that could be all underground, partially underground, what have you. And the other exciting thing is that the land can be used after you conduct this process. So the, like the idea may be in West Virginia and Kentucky that you can help remediate old coal mines with this process and then put solar on top, for example. It's just, the, it's just a super, I think there's a lot of interesting things. But the other the problem is you can only do this once per unit of land. So um, it does seem like, you know, there's not an infinite amount of land out there for this. Can you talk a little bit about how you view land or, or land area as a potential constraint and or opportunity for this process? Yes. And uh, in fact, we have done some calculation. Um, the conclusion is this. Um, to sequester one gigaton of CO2. Um, ah. Let me rephrase that. Um, if we build, let's say, a few hundred such facilities, wood vault, each with the size of a medium-sized landfill, um, a few hundred of them. You know, the cur currently there are six thousand operational landfills in the U.S. So we just need an order of magnitude fewer such wood vault facilities. They can sequester gigaton scale CO2 per year for 20 years to fill up their land, land capacity. Okay, so yeah, we have a paper that's coming out soon. I'll, I think it's better stated there. I just. I just didn't say it very Yeah, soon. we're going to keep an eye on when because I've, I've read a draft, but when is that paper coming out? It's or accepted. It's accepted. It's going to come out soon. Yeah. Like this calendar year? Definitely. I would say I'm doing a little final touch to the manuscript. That, I would say probably in a couple of months. That's great. I mean, I think that that metric of landfills is a really potentially um, a, a, an effective one when you talk about the process. That's very cool. Um, I could ask questions all day as usual, but um, we have tons of audience questions and they're really good and incisive. And some of them might be, you know, be ready. There might be a few challenges in there, but uh, I think Mega's going to hop on now and she's been organizing them and she's going to spend the last 15 or 20 minutes uh, on the audience questions. But thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Toby. Hey, yeah. So we have loads of audience questions that I'll uh, try to get through. 
Um, so a couple of people asked um, kind of just technically how far down does the wood need to be buried to actually avoid decomposition? And how does that kind of play into, you know, how do we do that kind of digging without creating significant emissions off of that? Okay, uh, the first part of the question, how far down? Um, depends on the soil condition. In the case of the Montreal project and some other places that I've seen, when it's clay, um, even one meter below is already basically anaerobic. Um, but if you have sandy soil, it's probably not a good place to, to bury it, or you have to export clay. And clay also has, of course, has different, uh, has a range of permeability. So that needs to be done. But one thing is, in fact, the idea has been misunderstood in the past is people often think as if it's just buried like one foot below the soil where you still have worms, everything going on. But the key is really, uh, what I would like to do is if let's say we have to consult about a project, we would say, well, take our sensors there. We're going to measure whatever your initial idea is of what soil should be like, is like, we're going to go down there and say, hey, this meters below the oxygen level is below such and such threshold, then it's okay. So we, I would like to approach it that way. And then the second part is the cost, right? So the Montreal project basically showed it's really very, um, uh, cost effective. The CO2 emission there is 2% of total, including mm -hmm. digging. Digging probably is about half. And then the transportation, it's just a few hundred meters in that case, is each about half and half. But we know, I, I advise uh, another project, which is fairly large scale, I would say really large scale, just like the wood vault I envisioned it's actually even better because the economy of scale, the operation in that case is less than 1% our initial estimate. Okay. So it's really about picking the right location where it's efficient rather than a kind of a blanket rule of thumb. And do it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I mean, kind of related to that, someone asked, are, um, are there like advantages to putting the wood in the ground versus bringing the ground to the wood? So having some kind of coating that creates anaerobic conditions or, you know, is that something you've considered? That's a great question. Yes. And um, it is possible to uh, treat the wood a little bit. And uh, we are proposing raw or minimal treatment. For example, you can, one thing is you found, you have a log and the, the two ends that got caught, stuff can, you know, water can penetrate in. The vessels can go really fast, but from the side when it's undamaged, so it's much harder to get in. Mm -hmm. You can even see in that photo I showed. And so if you, for example, spray waxy material on the two ends, that will help. Or maybe just char it a little bit. I don't want to go too far. If I go too far, it becomes biochar. So I try to stay on the minimal treatment side because there's a cost involved. Okay. And um, someone specifically asked in terms of just thinking about like where these projects happen um, that, you know, your experiment was obviously done in a colder climate zone. So how would this change things if you located it, for example, near the equator? Yeah, that's a very legitimate question. I think that question stems from, again, the observation of the active biosphere. We know that, you know, boreal forest, you can find 200 year old log lying on the surface, only slightly decomposed. But if you go to the Amazon, zero <laughs> such wood. And however, and I think we have enough evidence to show that once you bury it way down there in anaerobic condition, the latitude doesn't matter so much. And that's my current understanding. I'd be happy to go through the evidence and the reasoning I have, you know, offline with you. But my thinking is should not matter so much. Okay. And yeah, just in terms of other factors, um, someone asked, so just on a per acre basis, what would be, what's kind of the limiting factor for how quickly this can happen? Is it the sunlight, water, uh, ammonia, other nutrients? Um, do you have a sense of that? Uh, what do you mean quickly? You mean decomposition? 
I think more in terms of like, I guess, how quickly the biomass is accumulated and how you can, how quickly you can um, draw it down and then put that in underground. Oh, you mean like before you bury it? The yeah, I think that's what the question is. could decompose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, a dead tree in my backyard, my backyard is connected to a small piece of forest of the park. It has been there for 10 years, <laughs> but of course it's slowly decaying. But I think for our purpose, you want to balance. Um, of course, you bury immediately, that's the best in terms of decaying, but wood is so resistant to decomposition. There's an evolutionary reason for it. Um, such that I think leaving there for a few months, you will lose very little. So in fact, the same Montreal one we left for the whole season, but of course that's a winner. But the, the Florida project I advise is typically a few months. And uh, we have not really done the measurement, but just visually, it's still mostly there. <laughs> you know, we know the carbon is mostly there without even taking the measurement, but could could lose a little bit. So that needs to be taking into account, of course, in the you know process flow diagram. Yeah, we, we do take into that account with an estimate. Okay. Um, all right, we had a question that said, um, it's a bit of a long one, but I'll read the whole thing out. So given full life cycle analyses, how is the wood storage more cost-effective than using the wood to generate the energy that it's captured? Um, it seems like this is trying to correct a problem of pulling out fossil fuels and then offsetting this by burying the captured solar slash renewable energy. And um, so, you know, how, how does that trade-off work? And then as a side note, uh, how are you not burying other nutrients that the trees need to grow and therefore removing those nutrients from bulk forests? Okay, great question. Let me answer the second question first. Uh, nutrient lockup, that is indeed a very, very legitimate concern. And um, in my 2008 paper, I actually had a somewhat a thorough discussion, kind of a global view. Um, the nutrient lock, well, let me start with the basic science. It turns out woody material is very nutrient poor. It's 10 to 100 times less nutrient poor than leaf, you know, or the metabolic part. Again, there's an evolutionary reason for that. And so bury, that's why I don't really propose to bury leaves. I basically, so that's why I say woody biomass. Um, so it's very nutrient poor. So the global estimate is that even with a really, really grand scale, many gigaton kind of scheme, the nitrogen deposition, both natural and anthropogenic, is a, a few a factor of two or more higher than this nutrient lockup. So that's a key global number. Locally, in some areas, especially that's already nutrient poor, definitely will be a more severe problem. So it needs to be looked at locally. But we do know, like Southeast and U.S., many plantation forests have shown that harvesting certain amount of wood uh, away from furniture and other things can be done sustainably for the forest. And they actually do occasionally use some fertilizer. So if that is the case, you need to do the full life cycle analysis, see if, you know, that is worth it. If not, you got to step back, you know, don't press the ecosystem too much. <laughs> you know, we solve the climate problem. One reason is because to help the ecosystem. If we instead you're doing harm, then that's not a good thing. But what I want to say, the main thing is it can be done uh, sustainably. It's a question of how. Yeah, kind of on the ecosystem regeneration point, someone asked, um, when you harvest the wood, do you like do you expect to leave the root systems or leaves behind so that trees can regenerate more easily? Or how sort of how does the regeneration process work? Uh, if it's coppice, and of course you want to leave the, the stump there. And I actually don't see just logistically utilizing roots because it's just, you know, I pay $600 extra for them to just chop up that stump in my backyard. It's possible if it's cost effective to bury it. Um, you know, you dig a hole, you have to fill it. So again, my main concern is actually 
cost-wise, it's probably not effective to try to dig out the roots, but I'm open to be shown otherwise. <laughs> then we can get a little extra out of this operation. Okay, yeah. Um, another question was just on sort of the regulations that currently surround this. So would the wood, wood vaults that you have in mind be regulated as landfills or what kind of regulation currently surrounds these types of projects? Yeah, I, in fact, we're already running into a regulation um, obstacle. The Florida Project advice, the main obstacle there is um, this kind of urban waste wood is considered waste. Um, so it's subject to the environment department's uh, waste management. It needs a permit, which is a very, I didn't realize how difficult. I wrote a support letter for the operator to try to get a special uh, exemption. And I, we talked to landfill people here at Maryland because that's one of the three options I said we'd like to do. Our initial meeting was the landfill operator is like, we can't do it. It's <laughs> regu regulated. However, I actually think it's total doable. I'm optimistic. As long as we go to the Maryland Department of Environment, convince them it's not a waste, it's a value, it's valuable, and it's clean vegetation, it doesn't do any damage. I think it will happen very quickly. However, I do respect the law, so it needs to be changed at that level. And, but I, I'm optimistic it can be done. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a um, couple of last questions before I turn it back over to Toby. Um, so someone asked, um, how do you kind of avoid creating incentives for non-sustainable wood sources to be used in these processes um, as you sort of set up the right incentives to make this work? Can you explain that question? Yeah, I mean, I guess just, you know, to make sure that it's viable to do these projects, um, different policies or different regulations might help. But also in setting those policies, how do we make sure that we don't incentivize people to use sources of wood that might not be as sustainable as what you have in mind? Yeah, to me, that's a little bit beyond, uh, I guess, my knowledge base. But I think it's critically important. We have seen so many good ideas like planting trees, um, avoided deforestation, red, and so on. With all great intentions, it's great that needs to be done, but get abused or unintended consequences like the indigenous people actually, what is it called, colon, what is it, carbon colonialism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even, I would not have even thought about it this kind of colonialism, this what actually happened turned out to be like that. So again, I think it's a little bit beyond my expertise, but I think it's critically important. I'd love to join any group who would like to discuss this. I think it should be. This should go side by side, especially initially, let's say a couple of demo projects, megaton scale, 100 kiloton scale, it's okay. But once I think we get a megaton scale, even before, we need to have a conversation with all the stakeholders to talk about this, how to do it the right way. That's in fact the one thing like carbon lockdown project we set out to do, we said we want to do MRV certification. We have this in mind, we would like to be able to help at least in terms of to do the full carbon accounting. I think we have the scientific knowledge and basis expertise to help <laughs> contribute a little bit to this, I think it's most important, uh, more important than the technology aspect to me. Okay, um, I just have one last question before I turn it over. So I know you mentioned some things on the total scale of um, you know how much this can remove over time. Um, how much do you see that taking place in you know the U.S. or countries like that versus how much do we really need global cooperation to kind of make this a scalable solution? Um, my personal experience is, I think corporations, the private sector is playing a fantastic role. Frankly, the private sector is leading the public sector. Okay. <laughs> so not looking to the public sector yet. I hope the public sector can catch up. I tried, I tried the um, writing proposals and so on. But I think yeah. at this moment, private sector... I can see with this this forum here and the air miner forum I went, I can see private sector is leading the way right now. Okay. 
All right, uh, Dr. Zeng, so thank you so much. That was great. And I'm gonna hand it back to Toby now to just finish us up and talk about the next couple of weeks. Thank you, thank you everybody. Dr. Zeng, many thanks for that. It was really eye-opening and informative and we really appreciate you being with us. I know you're super busy, so thank you so much. And um, we put your, we took the liberty of putting your, uh, your University of Maryland site in the chat. So uh, anyone who's interested can reach out to you that way or Carbon Lockdown Project. Um, but this is uh, something, a conversation I think we should definitely continue. Um, Bunch of great uh, sessions coming up on this is CDR. Next week we have Solid Carbon, which is the um, the uh, direct air capture plus offshore wind plus uh, offshore geologic sequestration of the captured CO2 uh, idea that's being developed off the coast of British Columbia by, uh, this is CDR alum Dave Goldberg from Columbia and a group in Canada called Ocean Networks Canada. And super exciting and we're uh, it's gonna be a great one. Following week we have Danny Cullen Ward. We feel very fortunate because have him with us to talk about CDR standards, which, you know, we allude to every episode and which is a, a super important topic for us to, you know, unsolved problem, but something we need to get our minds around and keep thinking about. March 15th, we have Sestero, which is a North Carolina-based direct air capture company that is ready to deploy at scale, which is super exciting. Made of Air, Berlin-based uh, materials company, carbon negative <coughs> materials company, sorry about that, that, that creates carbon negative materials out of biochar. Uh, Future Forest Company on the 29th. They're based in the UK and they um, find durable ways to let forested landowners uh, participate in carbon markets via biochar and rock dust. Dr. Peter Kellerman on April 5th from Columbia to talk about CDR mineralization and then Verdox on the 12th to talk about electrochemical DAC pathways. Um, thank you again to everyone for being with us. There'll be a bunch of links in the chat. We'll keep that open for a couple minutes in case anyone wants to register for upcoming sessions or um, get any of the links about Dr. Zing's work. But thank you all for being with us. And Dr. Zing, thank you so much again for your time. That was a great presentation and we really appreciate you joining us. Be well, everyone. See you next week.